So David, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the experience of developing that inclu or more inclusive culture at the Army and specifically what you've learned about the role in inclusion and how that really benefited that culture shift in the Army? Well, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd always assumed that the culture of the Army was something uh, almost removed or independent from isolated and uh, uh, well, separate incidents of you know poor behaviour or exclusive behaviour or bullying or harassment or sexual predation, and it's a very big step, particularly for the leader of an organisation, to come to the view that in fact those isolated incidences are not isolated at all. They're, if you like, signposts along a path that leads you to the inescapable conclusion that the culture of the organisation has got systemic flaws within it. You know, the culture of the, the, the military, the culture of the army is sensational. It, it has sustained millions of men and women in the most dangerous and dire of circumstances for over a century. The idea of service before self, of courage, of loyalty to your mates, of initiative and teamwork, all really important. But you have to realise too that in the hands of some, the stories that develop as part of that culture and indeed eventually become the culture itself, because I think culture is largely the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves that we're prepared to believe in, become tools of exclusion. That if you're not part of the, the dominant tribe, you're either held at arm's length or, or not invited to come in. And if you want to be so bold as to try and get in, you'll be harassed and bullied until you leave. And there's plenty of instances of that. And indeed, the Royal Commission that's currently looking at the treatment of uh, younger Australians who have been uh, adversely uh, touched by their military service is again shining a light on what that culture, that, that the really awful, deleterious things that that culture can do. Now you can do one or two things then. You can set it to one side and say, no, we'll come back to the strengths of the culture because that's what makes the institution great. Or you can take a deep breath and with the help of extraordinary people, men and women inside the organisation, people brought in to help, you know, people like Liz Broderick, who you know, I, many people have heard me speak about Liz's influence not just on the military but certainly on me as a, as a, a, a person uh, and, I, and I mean it every time I say it. You know, she shone for me a light into uh, places that I, I had not looked either I had not looked hard enough at or hadn't looked in the way it needed to be looked at. And coming to that realisation then gets you to the starting point. That's it. It just gets you to the starting point. It doesn't give you all the answers. It so, doesn't create Camelot. But an interesting one though, does it get you to the starting point or does it get you as a leader to a point where you have to make a choice? Because I think that's what's really interesting uh, when we I, think about yeah. leadership today. Yeah, I reckon there are yeah. lots of people in their organisations and businesses to get that get to that point. They get the data, they get the information and as the leader, they then have to make a choice. And you made a brave one. No, I don't think I made a brave one at all. I think I made a decision that was best for in my, as I was the leader. Fairly quickly, I came to the decision that this was the best thing for the organisation. I mean, I think leaders define themselves by how they fashion the long-term health of the organisation they are leading. They absolutely see that their legacy is going to be realised probably well after they have finished their tenure. And I just realised that it was on my watch that something needed to be done. But if, if, not, if there'd been no response, you can give all the three minute YouTube clips <laughs> you want to. You can, you can write beautifully crafted directives from your air conditioned office in Canberra and nothing happens. The, the work that was done in the army was because thousands of men and women, particularly the men, because we were over 90% male when we started this journey, 
they responded in a way that said, all right, we understand the logic of this. It will make us more capable. We're going to do something about it. They're the ones who need to be recognised in this. Not, not me. I don't think I made a brave decision at all. I don't think it required any courage. I love the army more than anybody. Of course I would want the army to be robust, relevant to the, uh, the, 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 the men and women of Australia in the third decade of this century and the most capable military force it can be. And to get there, it needs a more inclusive culture that absolutely is focused on harnessing talent and potential. Absolutely. Thank you, David. I still think it was brave, but we not. <laughs> I still think. Well, I think that a lot of us look for. Maybe it's the idealists. The idealists in the room are very, very pleased that you made the call that you did. <laughs> and if you want to put right and wrong or black and white around it, but it still is a big call that a lot of people tell us every day in our in our world that their leaders aren't always prepared to make a call or the call.